This video is a big one for me because what we're going to talk about covers some potential big changes when it comes to fueling a triathlon. It also means that some of my previous videos might not contain information which is in keeping with the most up-to-date evidence. But that is the way with these things and my job is to let you know when I spot new research and how it might impact you. If you're new here by the way then my name's James and I'm a sports nutritionist and a race triathlonist too so you know it's in my best interest to let you know what's going on in the sporting world. So if you've watched any of my videos before on fueling strategies like how to fuel an Ironman or a half marathon, you'll know that I generally suggest the upper limit to be about 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour and that usually gels and liquids are preferable to solid foods because solid foods cause more gastrointestinal symptoms. Well, there's a study which might change how I approach things a little bit in terms of recommendations, and it's something that you can use in your nutrition strategies too. Researchers compared the amount of carbohydrate oxidation, or burning, when 120 grams of carbs were consumed per hour as either a drink, as gels, jelly chews, or as a mix of all three. They also compared gastrointestinal symptoms too to see whether they were affected. So first up, 120 grams of carbs per hour is a lot, like a lot. And secondly, comparing the three against each other and then as a mix is great because it covers the practical side of things. It's common for athletes not to want to consume just one source of carbs or not enjoy something like gel. So having data to back up recommendations here is awesome. Now, as a quick overview of this trial, they had nine trained endurance athletes repeat the same exercise test, which was three hours at 95% of their lactate threshold, immediately followed by a hold on for as long as you can type test at 150% of their lactate threshold. The researchers standardized the participants' dietary intake in the day before and then for the breakfast on the day of the trials. And then as you can see, gave the participants one of the three carbohydrate forms or a mix. They used well-trained athletes, but not elites, defining their athletic status by a new criteria, which is working its way into sports science research. To examine how much of the carbohydrates were absorbed and then used, the researchers used sports nutrition, which was enriched with stable isotopes at the manufacturing stage, which could be measured afterwards. And they used products which contained a 1 to 0.8 glucose to fructose ratio. And this ratio is currently only used by Martin and Science and Sport for their nutrition products. In all arms of the trial, participants consumed 800 milliliters of fluid per hour. So in the drink arm, it was as a carb liquid drink, but in the gel and jelly chew arms, the athletes drank 267 milliliters of water at each feeding mark so that the researchers could keep the total amount of fluid equal and minimize the risk of that confounding the results. What they found from their study was that there was no significant difference in the amount of overall carbohydrate absorbed and then used between the three forms or as a mix, meaning they were all equally as effective and that the time to exhaustion in the test afterwards was similar to with no statistical differences. There was also a water control arm and compared to this, the athletes all burned significantly more carbohydrate and lasted longer in the exhaustion trial. Conversely, those in the water arm used more fat for fuel and didn't perform as well in the final test. The researchers also found that the athletes reported minimal gastrointestinal symptoms during the trial with no significant differences between the carb forms. Now, this is some really impressive research, and although I haven't gone through everything from the paper, I've highlighted what, in my opinion, were the most significant findings. Now, we need to put things into context here and talk about how useful the data actually is. So firstly, a big take home message is that according to this research, you could use either a drink, a gel, a jelly chew, or a mix of all three during your exercise, and you would be getting the same benefit from them. So if you have a preference for one in particular, or like to mix it up a bit, then this is awesome news. Secondly, the athletes who were good athletes, but not elites, 
reported very minimal GI symptoms with 120 grams of carbs per hour, meaning that in theory, it's possible for lots of athletes to do this without getting GI upset as a result. So you could aim to consume 120 grams of carbs during exercise, which should help with endurance performance. However, there are a couple of things to say. Firstly, there was quite a varied individual response in the trial. What this image shows is that the max amount of carbs that athletes could use was quite different in terms of overall amount of carbs and for each individual product. So for example, some were better at using a drink and some were better at using a gel. This might mean that the athletes still had a lot of unabsorbed nutrition in their gut. And whilst they didn't report GI symptoms, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't later on if they had continued exercising. It also highlights that we're all different and even though someone else can, you might not be able to tolerate 120 grams of carbs per hour. The other massive thing here, which is important for triathletes and runners, is that this experiment was based on cycling. It's well known that runners report more GI symptoms, so I suspect had these athletes been runners or had to run afterwards, we might see more GI symptoms reported. So you need to take this into account and consider how it fits in for your endurance event. For example, in an Ironman, you could consider practicing fueling your bike leg even more so that at the start you're taking more on board and reducing the amount you take on over the rest of the race to reduce the likelihood of GI upset later on. Now importantly as well, this trial focused on steady state riding, which is very relatable to most triathletes and marathons. But if you're doing a race with a lot of above threshold efforts, then because the demands are different, you wouldn't be able to infer that the same results would still apply. So again, you've got to consider your event. But overall, this trial gave some super, super interesting results and gives a lot of food for thought in terms of trying to increase athletes' carb consumptions during endurance events. For me, it's great as well because the idea of adding jelly chews as an additional product to a nutrition plan is awesome. I should highlight though that I'm very specifically talking about jelly chews and not things like sports bars. The difference here is that jelly chews contain almost zero fiber fat or protein, and that's critical as it's these nutrients which are usually found in higher amounts in solid foods and then usually cause GI upset. I actually did a review recently on the whole science and sports beta fuel range and boldly said that I think beta fuel chews are probably my favorite sports nutrition product. In fact, I think I'd actually go as far as to say that this is probably my favorite sports nutrition product. It's really good. Yeah, there we go. So this study was music to my ears or eyes, because whilst reading it, I immediately thought about the chews and how they might be the perfect fit. This study also used products with a 1 to 0 0.8 maltodextrin or glucose to fructose ratio, meaning that you can't specifically apply the results of this study to products that use a 2 to 1 ratio because it might not be the same results. But that actually brings me on to a really significant thing to talk about. If you look in the methodology section of the paper, you'll see that the researchers actually used science and sport products for it. Then if you look in the funding section, you can see that there was a grant by SIS for the research and that some of the authors are associated with SIS in one way or another. So we have to ask the question, as to whether we can trust the results of this study because of where the funding comes from and the obvious positive connection between the results of this study and the beta fuel range. My view on it is that we should always be skeptical and question this sort of thing, but yes, we can trust this study. The study itself was very good and it wouldn't have been cheap to run. If you want good research, it needs money and that's got to come from somewhere. In a perfect world, you'd have studies that aren't funded by anyone in particular, so there's no agenda as such. But I don't think we should discount studies just based on funding. And some of the authors like Louise Burke and James Morton are also highly, highly respected and have worked in various top positions within sports. So overall, I think this study contributes some excellent data to sports nutrition, and I'm personally happy to consider it as evidence to use when considering fueling requirements.
science. Hopefully there will be more research like this in the future, but it just adds to our understanding and helps us to push our boundaries. This could be something that you can start adding into your own nutrition plans for endurance events so that you can smash your goals out of the park. Now, if you're interested in my full review of the new science and sport Beta Fuel Ranger, then I've put the video here for you along with another one that you might find useful. Otherwise, hopefully you found this video helpful and I would love to know if it changes your thoughts on nutrition strategies. So let me know and I'll catch you next time.